Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Lawrence Rudolph? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. Lawrence Rudolph met Bianca Venezio when he was in dental school and Bianca was working on her bachelor's degree at the University of Pittsburgh. My understanding is that Lawrence goes by the name Larry, so that's how I will refer to him. The couple married around the same time that Larry started a dental practice in Pennsylvania. This was around 1982. Initially, Bianca worked in a dental office, but after the couple had two children, she spent less time there. It appears as though Larry had children from a previous marriage as well. Sometime around 2006, Larry became disabled to some extent. He broke away from his partners at the practice and opened up a new practice, which was also in Pennsylvania. It's not clear what disability he had or how it affected his work. Over the years, Larry and Bianca spent a lot of time hunting in a variety of locations, including Africa. They really seemed to have a pronounced interest in hunting. Over time, the trips became more frequent. It wasn't just Larry who was interested. Bianca took a genuine interest in the activity as well. Sometimes she would go on hunting trips without Larry, and they were both active members at a hunting organization. Sometime around 2012, the couple moved to Arizona, but Larry's dental practice remained in Pennsylvania. He would regularly travel back and forth. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. Larry and Bianca traveled to Zambia several times in 2016. Their last scheduled trip was from September 27 through October 11. The couple had two firearms with them, a Browning 12-gauge shotgun, and what was referred to as a Remington 375. I'm going to assume that the FBI agent who documented the charges was referring to something like a Remington 700 chambered in 375 H&H. Although there are many different 375 cartridges, including the 375 Remington Ultra Magnum. The various 375 cartridges are popular for big game hunters. They are capable of killing any land animal on the planet. Larry did not actively hunt during this trip to Zambia, but Bianca did. She made this trip with the express goal of killing a leopard. Apparently, the couple was only able to purchase one permit for that particular animal. She did not achieve this goal, but she did kill several other animals during the trip. On the last day of the trip, October 11, the couple was in their cabin packing in preparation for their departure. According to Larry, here's what happened. Sometime between 5.15 and 5.30 a.m., he was in the bathroom and his wife was packing in the bedroom. Larry heard a gunshot. He exited the bathroom to find his wife on the floor and bleeding from her chest. He unsuccessfully tried to resuscitate her. A hunting guide and a game scout who were nearby in the dining hall heard the gunshot and ran to assist the Rudolphs. They saw Bianca on the floor and a shotgun near the door. It was inside a partially zipped, soft-sided gun case. The Zambian police investigated. They determined that only one shotgun shell was loaded in the shotgun when Bianca was shot. They said the shell was in the weapon overnight and that Bianca accidentally discharged the Browning 12-gauge shotgun in the morning. At about 4.30 p.m., Larry called the U.S. Embassy and quickly turned the conversation to the topic of cremating his wife's body. He indicated that transporting her body would be challenging, so that's why cremation made more sense. The consular chief became suspicious and took a number of pictures of Bianca's body in order to preserve the evidence. The wound on Bianca's chest was described as being six centimeters in diameter. It did not appear to be a contact wound. There was a secondary injury caused by the wadding from the shotgun shell. So the wadding is typically made of plastic and it sits between whatever shot is in the shotgun shell, like double O buck for example, and the propellant. So when the weapon is discharged, the wadding comes out at a high speed as well. The chief determined that the shotgun was fired at a distance of about six and a half to eight feet from Bianca's chest. Larry called the chief and was quite angry 
that he had taken photographs of his wife's body. On October 14, Larry met the chief at the funeral home. Larry repeatedly inquired about the Privacy Act and how it applied in Zambia. He specifically wanted to know who would have access to police reports. Larry was asked if he knew what type of shotgun was used. He said he did not know. He only knew it was an antique. Larry suggested that his wife may have brought an end to her own life using the shotgun, so it may not have been an accident after all. The FBI started investigating the incident after a friend of Bianca's contacted them and said that she wanted them to investigate the death. The FBI discovered some interesting information. Seven life insurance policies were in effect when Bianca died. The oldest policy was from 1987, but several policies had been updated and adjusted over the years all the way through 2016. Larry Rudolph was the beneficiary on the policies. He started claiming the policies between October 31 and November 14, 2016. He was paid on the policies between January and March of 2017. Altogether, the seven policies were worth $4.8 million. Larry Rudolph was charged with foreign murder and fraud. He was arrested in December of 2021. Now moving to my analysis. Was Larry Rudolph guilty of murder? It's worth noting at this point, of course, that he is presumed innocent. Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea of guilt, starting with the inculpatory factors. Bianca's friend, who called the FBI, indicated that Larry was having an affair at the time Bianca died and was involved in multiple affairs prior to that. She said the couple would fight about money and Larry was verbally abusive. Bianca's children and some of her friends did not find out about her death until about a week after the incident. Larry told the consular chief that Bianca wanted to be cremated. He made it seem as though he had worked this out with his wife in advance. Her friend said that Bianca was Catholic and had once expressed disapproval when the friend's husband was cremated. Bianca told the friend that Larry was never going to divorce her because he didn't want to lose his money, and she was never going to divorce him because she was Catholic. Sounds like the motivation for a happy and fulfilling marriage. The ex-wife of the hunting guide told the FBI that she had first met the Rudolphs in 2010 and regularly saw them in Zambia. She considered them to be friends and was there in Zambia at the time of the incident. She had a few interesting things to say about Larry's behavior after Bianca's death. Larry seemed to be in a rush to have Bianca cremated and paid an official in Zambia to expedite the cremation process. He ignored any customs related to Catholicism as if he didn't care about what his wife's preferences were, and he did not take calls from his children. Larry told the authorities that it would be challenging to transport his wife's body to the U.S., but he regularly transported animals that he killed to the U.S., which is more expensive, time-consuming, and cumbersome than transporting a human body. A former employee at Larry's dental practice said that she knew one of Larry's girlfriends. The girlfriend worked at the dental practice and was in a relationship with Larry for 15 to 20 years. The girlfriend gave Larry an ultimatum saying that he had to leave his wife within one year. The FBI found out that Larry and his girlfriend traveled to Mexico seven times between 2010 and July of 2016. And in 2017, only a few months after his wife died, they traveled there again. The shotgun that killed Bianca Rudolph was owned by Larry Rudolph. The hunting guide said that Larry unloaded and cleaned the shotgun the night before Bianca's death. How did Larry not know what type of shotgun he was handling? The shotgun was about 42 inches long. The distance between the muzzle and the trigger was about 31 inches. Bianca was 5 foot 4. Her arms were about 27 inches long. How did she reach the trigger? The Browning shotgun was easy to put in the soft-sided case. It was not a tight fit. There was no reason that Bianca would have needed to handle the gun in an unusual way to get it inside the case. And she did not have to hit it with her hand to get it in the case. Even if she did hit it with her hand, that would not cause the weapon to discharge. Only pulling the trigger would do that. The FBI determined that the shotgun was discharged between 2 
and three and a half feet from Bianca's chest. This is a shorter distance than what the authorities in Zambia believed, but it is still inconsistent with the idea that she accidentally shot herself. Now moving to the exculpatory evidence. There are no witnesses to the alleged crime, no video. Bianca had long fingernails, which may have made contact with the trigger unintentionally. The trigger on the shotgun was considered light. It did not require a lot of force to discharge the weapon. And the authorities in Zambia had their suspicions, but they did determine that the death of Larry's wife was an accident. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Larry Rudolph is guilty? I think that he is guilty in reality and probably guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but of course we'll have to wait for the trial to know with any certainty. The big problem for Larry is the idea that the shotgun was discharged two to three and a half feet from his wife. He already locked into the story that he was alone with her in the cabin, so now he can't go back and say there was an intruder, like maybe the leopard that his wife was trying to kill came back in to get a bit of revenge. Larry implied that perhaps his wife had brought an end to her own life. This gives him some flexibility in the story. Now there is one more option in addition to an accent, but it doesn't get around the distance problem. Somebody else pulled the trigger. Only one other person was in the cabin. As if this wasn't bad enough for Larry, he was having an affair, was in a rush to have his wife's body cremated, and collected about $4.8 million in life insurance. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Larry appears to be a high sensation seeker, always looking for adventure and excitement. The hunting in Africa, the extramarital affairs and the trips to Mexico. Larry wanted to get a lot out of life. Even though his wife enjoyed hunting as well, Larry didn't view her as compatible. He was more interested in his girlfriend. He could have divorced his wife, but he did not want to give up the money. When his girlfriend pressured him to make a decision, he thought of a way to not only get rid of his wife, but receive millions of dollars. He chose Zambia as the location for the crime because he knew that bribery was somewhat common there, and he assumed that the authorities would be happy to look the other way. Zambia has had severe economic problems for many years. About 55% of its citizens live below the poverty level. People like Larry Rudolph are important to the economy. His hunting activity would fall under tourism, which is a major source of income for Zambia. Hunting trips to Zambia are quite expensive. It would not be unusual for a foreign hunter in Zambia to spend somewhere between thirty and $50,000 on one hunting trip. Some hunters have spent over $100,000 on a single trip. The license to hunt a leopard is over $10,000 just by itself. What Larry Rudolph did not count on was the persistence of the FBI. He may have believed that as long as he was okay in Zambia, that he was okay anywhere. Almost like he was thinking of Las Vegas. What happens in Zambia stays in Zambia. Now moving to my final thoughts. There are many different types of affairs. This case appears to feature a long-term and supposedly stable affair. Like everybody involved knew the arrangement and just tolerated it. They were all disingenuous. I think this case exemplifies that no affair is really stable. Very few people are okay with sharing a romantic partner. Love can lead to possessiveness. I guess one could say that love and possessiveness have a long-term stable relationship that will not tolerate an affair with the mistress of common sense. Those are my thoughts on the case of Lawrence Rudolph. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.